the author of the book Native Resistance. Let's see where we at here. There we go. Native Resistance. And we're going to go into a little bit of the intro. I'm going to open up um, the first intro and just give a little bit about the author. And then um, we're going to talk a little bit about chapter one. And so I'll start off with Dr. Lenita Warjack is a member of the Shoshone Bannock tribes of Idaho. She's Banakwa, but the government calls the tribe Bannock. She comes from a rich culture and was not taught her native language because her parents feared that they, she would be punished the way they were tortured in school. She attended the University of California at Berkeley and graduated in an independent major of Native American law and politics. While a student at UC Berkeley, she participated in the Native American component of the first ethnic studies program in the UC statewide effort and established Native, Black, Chicano, and Asian studies. In 1969, and other students throughout California took over Alcatraz Island in a peaceful protest of the federal government's ill treatment of native people and broken treaties with tribes. This facilitated certain sub subsequent government funded policies for Indian tribes nationwide while recovering millions of acres of land back. Pursuing enforcement of the obligations of treaties and Indian rights, Lenita was on the founding steering committee and executive committee of the North American Rights Fund. Nearly a decade, she maintained a current relationship wherein been involved in the fundraising efforts. Lenita had been elected councilwoman for the tribe and served many boards, local and national. And this is just the start of her journey. And throughout the book, I really encourage, you know, we'll... Uh, Lenita has been um, selling these books already online, and we'll, we'll include that in the link as we go along. But I want to uh, introduce you to Dr. Lenita Warjack. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Hello. How are you? Uh, finally. Pijana. Technical difficulties yeah, yeah. taken care of. I had to open up my brand new Mac, and it was didn't I was able to just get on with no problem. I was on my old Mac. I don't know why. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, as part of my introduction, uh, thank you. I just wanted to show you the, the cover of my book. And the picture on the cover is my father. Mm -hmm. And my father is in the Sundance. And this was in the early 1920s when it was illegal to practice our, or take part in our ceremonies, to speak our languages, uh, to have anything to do with our culture. So to me, it was resistance because he went ahead and, and others did as well to continue to practice those ceremonies which carried us through that time because um, there, there are many forms of, of resistance, but uh, one way, that was his way, and, and to pray for the future as well. But um, he was my inspiration for this book. He was a chairman of the Shoshone Bannock Tribes. And I always went to his, his meetings. I was just a teenager. This was in the early 60s, uh, late 50s. And then I found out about uh, the Termination Act, Public Law 280, and the Land Claims Act, which was legitimizing the steal of our nation's territories. And... I got in, he, he kind of turned me on to all the laws and policies, the treaties and everything that was going on just as a teenager. And so uh, I just continued to advocate in that direction because I saw how the government got rid of him, you know, by bringing in another person. Uh, mm -hmm. And... Uh, they got him out, 
or they got my father out and he was reelected back in and the government refused to see them. So, you know, the injustices of everything that was going on at the time, the discrimination in the local towns, no Indians or dogs allowed. And it just, uh, it just became a part of me, you know, this whole uh, advocacy role that I started playing after I saw what happened to my father and what he was doing. So uh, I went out on relocation to the to San Francisco because we were the next generation of uh, natives who was uh, the children of the boarding school children. And the boarding school mm -hmm. children, which my parents were a part of, I mean, it was mandated by law. They were taken away as children and put into uh, Christian and government boarding schools. So we were the next generation coming through. And so their plan for us was to send us into the cities to relocate us into the mainstream of American society. And that would be their way of... Uh, getting rid of the Indian and saving the man, so to speak. What was it kill the Indian and save the man? That was kind of their, uh, what they were pushing through. And so when I got into San Francisco, well, you know, like I was 18 years old, but, you know, I thought I was all grown up and <laughs> uh, could handle everything. And, and so I just went about that way like I could do it and I uh, was there for a few years until I figured out uh, that I wanted to uh, get back into college get into college and so I found out that the mission rebels in the mission district in San Francisco were sending their their youth into the University of California at Berkeley and so I asked them if they could uh, support me as well. And they said they would, and they did. And they hooked me up with UC Berkeley. And I was in on probationary status until I could prove that I could do the work, and I did. And I just maintained high grades all the way through. But it, it was really difficult because in that process, we, uh, I was able to recruit more native students until we had enough to have our own student organization. And just right as soon as we got our student organization, the third world strike started at San Francisco State first. And then we initiated our own third world strike at Berkeley. And that was to uh, initiate third world studies or ethnic studies. So we were successful in our attempts in, in our protests and our strike at Berkeley. We're the last ones in the 60s to have a strike. And we got mm -hmm. all the support of everybody and we implemented uh, ethnic studies, the first in the nation, and then it went out from there. And so as in the fall, after we got that, uh, our department successfully uh, working, then the issue of San Fran of, uh, Alcatraz came up and I was a chair of the student group at San Francisco State and Richard Oakes was chair of the group at, uh, I mean, he was the chair of the group at San Francisco State and I was a chair at UC Berkeley. So all of the Native American students in the Bay Area, we always went to conferences together, powwowed together. And so we all knew each other quite well and that's when we took Alcatraz Island uh, to protest the uh, just treatment of our people on the reservations, the broken treaties, and uh, the bad policies and laws that were impacting us. So in 1970, uh, it was a 19 month occupation. We started in November of uh, 69, and it went on until June of 71, it was 19 months. So uh, while we were there, the first thing that Nixon did, President Nixon was he stopped that termination policy, public law 280. 
and he signed an executive order doing away with it because 106 tribes lost their reservations in that uh, termination era. And also uh, we lost our, our territories, our nations, because as we're organized as nations, we're not organized by states or federal corporations. The suit was initiated as, as a tribal nation. And so what they did was they just changed it into federal corporations so that we would eat come from a state. And then when we claimed our territory, because we were all removed to all these different reservations, but as, as tribes, then we all claimed a certain area. And they said that would be a conflict of interest so they could cut it out and they it was crazy, but what happened was they wound up getting all of our lands and uh, just leaving us our reservations that were reserved for us. And it wasn't really a good thing that was happening on the reservation because of the poverty. And then mm -hmm. along with that, then the drugs and the alcohol came. I mean, I wasn't there when drugs happened when I was a teenager they it was just alcohol at that time but when I went to California you know it was drugs all over the place but um, our people on the reservations got caught up into the that poverty and uh, drugs and alcohol became rampant suicide in 1968 when uh, Kennedy came out. It was Robert Kennedy came out to Fort Hall. We were, you know, the suicide rate, we were the highest over 10 times national average. And of course, it was unheard of in the American population at that time. But now it's, you know, it's pretty rampant everywhere. And suicide, <clears throat> suicide is, mm -hmm. new, but uh, with Alcatraz, uh, we tried to. Uh, make our point, but, you know, over the years, uh, it's just gone backwards because uh, we had a lot of help at that time. Nixon made the difference for us, and that's why I knew every president thereafter didn't do anything. They didn't do anything to support us. Nixon stopped the termination era. He doubled the BIA budget. He tripled the IHS uh, medical budget. You know, he did a lot of things to uh, support a uh, native, and actually, it was uh, it, it initiated self determination era. And since that time, since the seventies, we've kind of we've gone backwards. And uh, I think, Lenita, with with Nixon, what I learned at Haskell Indian Nations University is that his coach was Native American. Isn't that amazing? So he, so he had an understanding of what the struggle was about. And and uh, for viewers that may not know, uh, the issues that she's talking about on the reservations is part of the historical trauma that we are articulating today at those times from the loss of land, poor source of language, you know, indoctrination, colonization. And um, those are, that's part of now uh, we're healing from the historical trauma. That's right. And the assimilation into colonized Western ideology uh, so that we forget our culture. But with Alcatraz, it reinitiated our identity as Native people and reinforced it. And so there was a strong drive at that time for everybody to start learning their languages, their culture their ceremonies, their traditions, because it was against the law. In 1890, they made it against the law to for us to do that and at the same time to call the children. So we went through a lot, uh, which is now termed historical trauma, and uh, initiated the cycle of dysfunction that we're living in now on the reservations, which includes the uh, the alcohol and drugs and the, 
in the poverty. So it's it hasn't been uh, the perfect existence because we're under control of the federal corporations. We're not on the state side. We were put on the federal side because they were trying to protect us from the states because the states wanted everything. Mm -hmm. And it's still kind of the issue today. And, and it's, a, it's a continuing fight, but we, you know, are trying to retain our lands, whatever lands we have left on our reservations. We're trying to retain our culture and our traditions, but we kind of initiated that whole self-determination era when we took Alcatraz. And it started with Nick mm -hmm. and, and what he did for us. And, of course, we've taken 10 steps forward and 20 steps backwards now, or 40, since the last administration because of the, you know, the bad policies and uh, everything that has been initiated under the last administration. So we're having to recover from that, and I'm really hopeful with the new presidential administration it'll be better so this is a um in this book for people who don't understand you guys actually occupied alcatraz island you live there can you give us a little insight on what that was like because you were a student you were a mother and and you were going back and forth to class as well as you know trying to educate the greater public on why indigenous people were taking over this island, this, the reason, particular reason why Alcatraz. <laughs> well, we were prepared for uh, the impact because we didn't know that it would, it would change so many things. And it was okay to live on the island because we were young and we didn't have a lot of issues with our health. And, I mean, we didn't even know it was cold. <laughs> we had no electricity, no running water or any of that. But, you know, we were survivors because we came from the reservations or the cities, you know, the ghettos. They, we couldn't live anywhere very we couldn't, we didn't have that kind of money to, to have everything. So we were kind of conditioned to live in those kind of. Uh, the people brought you out food and supplies. Yeah, uh, they did. Uh, we lived off of the uh, donations that were made and it, it was pretty, pretty interesting to live there. I and my son, Danon, lived there. He was called the Alcatraz kid. He was two and a half. <laughs> and now that I think back, you know, I, it really scares me how I just let him run around. And, of course, he ran with a whole pack of little kids. He was the youngest one. But uh, now I just... Uh, Ha, you know, I, I would never allow it now, but, you know, when you're young, you're not afraid of anything and things don't frighten you so much. So it was exciting. It was, a you know, nice. We didn't think it was a bad place to live. It, we loved living in the middle of the bay and I would hitchhike and would hitchhike off the dock on Sunday when all the sailboats go out, we would go to the Berkeley Marina and then I kept uh, my apartment at the University Village. It was only 60 bucks a month at that time. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, we would clean up and I would check in with my professors and turn in my papers. I, I wrote a lot of, I wrote a lot out on the island. I, I did proposals for the island. I worked on the, uh, um, the Alcatraz anniversary, we constructed a, a model of what we were going to change the uh, the island into. And we wanted to set up our, our cultural center and museum and uh, ecology. So and there was something really interesting, Lenita, when we went to the 50th, 
as I saw pictures of, you know, that very rare pictures and from just me and you talking, it was really similar to Standing Rock because you guys were decolonizing your curriculum as well for the students. You had a school there, right? <laughs> yes. Well, and it's easy to do it for us because it's just telling the truth. And, you know, what we have now is just, you know, kind of a, a whitewashed version of, of the truth. But uh, we're still hoping that, you know, the truth will come out about what happened to us and our people, the genocide, the boarding schools, you know, children taken away, languages. Uh, we're trying to come back. Um, and learn our natural laws and uh, be the people that we were. But, of course, it's really hard uh, because, you know, the people are, are medicine leaders and our strong leaders. Of course, they were all taken out first. And... Mm -hmm. We've been able to retain some ceremonies, like at, at Fort Hall, we've been able to retain our our Sundance ceremony. Uh, we have our sweats, but you know we had other things. And our foundation of knowledge uh, was a good base that not many people, you know, talk about or are aware of, you know, of how we lived, but. With the natural laws, it, we had to be respect life and all life because we lived within our geographic ecosystem and we took up the plants and the animals as our medicines and as our symbols. And we just became part of that circle of life. And we were able to... Uh, survive in, in a very good way. We were healthy. We migrated to certain areas for food. And when, of course, when they put us on the reservations, that cut us off from our food supplies and our people starved. And then, then they said, well, we're going to give you food. And, and of course, you know, when we got our rations, it was rotten or sometimes we didn't even get it. So many people starved, and as a result, you know, we still have a really poor diet because we don't have all the good foods that we had. We don't have the activity that we had in doing things, you know, hunting and, and taking care of the food and, and moving around, setting up our camps. You know, we live a different mm -hmm. place on the reservation, and it's pretty sedentary, like, like we're all old people or something and we just have to try to keep ourselves healthy and happy the best way that we can. Mm, you know, an elder, I heard an elder once say, um, we are becoming our food now before we used to be built like our food. We chased it. We were lean and now we're becoming like a chicken nugget. <laughs> well, you know, with the Shoshone nation, you know, like our nation extended from Mexico to Canada. And, you know, it composed a lot of tribes, the Utes, the Paiutes, the Comanches, the Hopis, the Bannocks, Shoshones, uh, Agua Caliente, the Mission. Uh, you know, like we were pretty extensive, but it was easy to divide us because we were so large. And mm -hmm. we were down within our nation. And we knew each other, you know, the Bannocks, I know we, and, and Bannock isn't even our name. Uh, we're Banakwa, but uh, mm -hmm. the government called us Bannock and, you know, that's bread. <laughs> but uh, the, the uh, Scotch came through and uh, showed us how to make their bread and that's the Bannock bread comes from Scotland, Scotch bread. Yep. And of course, everybody thinks it's a traditional food now, but. Um, yeah, they're making it all over on TikTok now and, you know, doing their one minute videos of making Bannock bread. 
<laughs> I want let's go back to um, chapter one, balancing land and life. And and uh, I know we were gonna uh, start off with um, reading reading a, a few of the the paragraphs here. I'll let you start with it. Lynetta is actually getting ready to transcribe her book into audio, and she got a new computer. Uh, new new mic, new Yeti mic, and in the process is going to make her own audio book here, and we're looking forward to that. And um, so I'll turn it over to you, Lineda, and we'll start with uh, the few first few pages here. Okay, do you want me to start with the preface, the introduction, or chapter one? Um, start where you start where you prefer. Okay, I'll start with chapter one. We are raised to understand that Western civilization is the backbone of modern day society, including its establishment and progression. The known history of human progress derives from Europe in the last 500 years in America, but not from our continents or from the indigenous people's perspective of North and South America. Every attempt has been made to destroy the history of the indigenous people throughout the land. Therefore, our historical narrative continues to be muted and replaced with the colonizer's version in order to hide the truth, dehumanize us, and justify genocide. Untruths, injustice, misinformation, inaccurate media portrayal, political propaganda, legislation, and stereotyping are only some of the ways we have been victimized including being subjected to the genocidal process, the dehumanizing and untruthful portrayals of events, our people and status has had lasting negative and damaging effects. We need to make concerted efforts to correct, educate, and recognize the discriminatory and racist practices that still take place today. Respect for all members of the human race and the elimination of biases, prejudices, and discriminatory practices must continue to be the goals we all strive for in the process of supporting strong moral and ethical principles that defy racism and injustice. So that's the first page, and uh, I have a little in, uh, on, on the very top uh, of chapter one, Balancing Land and Life, I said, the world has been told by philosophers, historians, and theologians that a fact based upon truth cannot be killed and that we will not die. The injustice has a way of coming to light where human beings are involved. Wrongs such as have been perpetrated against the Indian people cannot be hushed up and do not die. And this statement came from uh, our tribal attorney, Ben Davis, who was the attorney for the Shoshone Bannock tribes in 1957. You know, on, on the other page, I really like what, what you shared about the stories on how it can be told from many different perspectives. You have here, it can be told from your perspective, it can be told from a Western perspective. It can be told from an indigenous perspective. It can be told from a media standpoint and also the legal view. Um, can you go into a little bit about how those, uh, those that are watching that don't understand Indian law or indigenous, you know, when we talk cultural protocols, you know, I, I know that's kind of probably a buzz in what you're sharing here when you talked about the natural law. And then you read in the first, the first paragraphs here, it's a little bit of Indigenous 101, isn't it? It is. <laughs> um, I will, I could, on the next page, uh, it, I state, as I research and examine our past, I've already gone through all the varying stages of rage and defiance, and I feel deeply saddened by the increasing awareness about the truth of our history, yet, I must be able to tell my story and remain positive in the face of harsh truths. Once truth is revealed and uncovered, we must not become embittered, but stay strong and avoid allowing the bitterness to overtake us. There are varying stages that we as individuals must face, then allow the healing to take place. 
this is very this is a very important stage to overcome so uh do not be weak truth is knowledge knowledge is power peace is the only direction we have but we can also educate and carry our spiritual knowledge into future generations this will make us stronger and more empowered there are many perspectives from which to tell a story. A story can be told from a Western perspective. And of course, all our books and everything we have right now is from the Western perspective. Uh, and it can also be told from an indigenous perspective, which I'm sharing. Can, it can be told from a media standpoint, from a legal view, from an active participant who has had the duty to perform from a leadership position, or from a spiritual perspective, and it might incorporate the many different viewpoints all at once. Common sense tells us not to become what we're fighting against because this only allows the negative forces to impact our health, mind, body, and spirit. The truth is sometimes the bitter truth and can make individual people feel uncomfortable. So we should not take anything personal unless we need to make a paradigm shift. I'm a woman of prayer and I am not a Christian, but I hold remnants of spiritual understandings that date back before Christianity arrived from Europe. I do not follow a man-made religion. I originate from a nation of natural laws and spirituality that existed here in our continents before the government boarding school brainwashing or acculturation, forced assimilation into Western society, and the genocide that took its toll on all our Native people. I understand that most people do not know our true history, and I'm sorry for Native people who only know Christianity and need a crutch for guidance and faith. I understand because many of us have been forcibly indoctrinated into Christianity, which was imposed upon us. However, we lived in a time when we were more advanced because the Christ, uh, before the Christians first arrived on our continents. Uh, the, there are those who will continue to deny the truth, and there are books already written and taught in all the social and educational institutions that support that limited point of view. I want to know more from outside of the realms of institutional propaganda I have examined the research, read between the lines, reconstructed, and learned again. Hence, I do not cite many non-Indian historians and educators because they only support each other to uphold their own perspectives. This is from my personal story, talking with elders who have already gone, taking part in ceremonies, learning my Native culture, and listening to prophecy. I have read the legislative research, studied federal Indian law, and researched European history. We must keep an open mind and learn from our truths and our wisdom from the past and present so that we can create a greater future. As Native people, we know we have been denied our history and culture, which predates American colonialism and so-called Western ideology. We had a history before the military records and legislation established by Congress. The Western perspective cannot validate or continue to pretend to have the knowledge about the Native American experience based upon their dominance, version, and perspective. The indigenous ideology is based upon our natural laws, a concept that the Western mainstream mentality cannot conceptualize because much of our knowledge and practice of the natural laws and of the spiritual world have been blocked or hidden. Mainstream Western society does not acknowledge or legitimize our indigenous foundation. And this is the reason why we wanted a Native Studies curriculum and imposed it into the educational institution because we were hoping that we would be able to also share our perspectives and our true history and our, our knowledge. But uh, over the last 50 years, we still haven't been that successful. What, what do you see? You know what the problem is. 
What is the, what is the solution? Well, the problem is still colonialism. You know the uh, the Western perspective is totally dominated the educational institutions and all of the social institutions. And of course, we're starting by saying, okay, we got to decolonize, but a lot of people don't really understand or know what that means, what it is to decolonize, because, you know, just in the language itself, the English language, it's very <laughs> colonized terminology, say, oh, I want to share this information with you is, is, is a complete gold mine. Well, this is what Damon was telling me. My son, he's, he says, and I was using the term gold mine, and he says, ah, that's gold mine is what they came to do to us to take the minerals and to uh, steal, extract. extract, destroy the land, and extract. And, and you know, like everybody knows that gold mine means that it's a gold mine, but you know, it's colonist terminology so it's everywhere throughout our terminology that we use those terms which uh, it, it dominates everything so you know I think probably the best thing we can do is to educate ourselves and take another look because and that's what I did with my book is it's from the indigenous perspective. It's not coming from Western civilization or ideology. It's not coming from uh, their dominance or their version or their stereotypes, but it's, you know, our version. And, and people may not like it because it's the truth and the truth hurts, but it has to be said, you know, like my daughters always tell me, mom, you got to stay away from politics and religion when you talk, you know, because I don't think anything now that I just say it, you know, like, well, <laughs> you know, they made it up. The only, yeah. the only thing that's, that's real are the natural laws. And that's what yeah. we followed and respected. And now we don't do mm -hmm. that. And you know, my, my aunt, she always said it's hard to be Paiute. Our people, you know, have protocols that they have to do when the sun rises, when the sun sets. There's a lot of protocols. And we don't have access anymore to live that way traditionally. The natural laws and the original instructions. We have a lot of conveniences. Mm-hmm. And she don't, you know, she'd always just explain. She goes, you know, our Paiute people, you know, they 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 don't uh, they don't have access to live that way anymore. Traditional foods are gone, medicines are gone, water is no longer drinkable above the surface to drink anymore. Can't drink out of the springs anymore. Fish are contaminated, mm -hmm. and just so on and so on. You know, harder and harder to uh, harvest our traditional foods because they're farther and farther away from deforestation. That's happening from the Forest Service and BLM and and uh, expansion of the bombing ranges here in Nevada. Exactly. And um, you know, it's like I want to I want to look at the hope, but you know, I I remember drinking out of those springs when I was a kid, and no longer can you drink out of those springs mm -hmm. in my own areas. You know what what is the hope? What is your hope? You know, as you you were at Standing Rock, you know, and where we were on Facebook Hill, and you know when we were talking and. You know, what is your hope? Because you're, you, you went through this twice, Alcatraz and at Standing Rock. Yeah, and everything in between um, and continues. The, the only thing I can do as, as one person, you know, because we can only control ourselves, you know, and we try to promote good things the best way that we can and lead by example. And my hope is just through my prayers, because that's one thing we have, you know, but, you know, we have to know how, how that all works. And I talk a little bit about that. And a lot of people, a lot of our people don't like to share that, that spiritual side because of the way that, 
others get a hold of it and they misuse it or try to make money off of it or whatever. And things get, you know, misused and misguided, but it's the prayers that are so important. Uh, that's something that we can carry on that doesn't involve uh, not not being able to gather our traditional foods to stay you know, we have to stay healthy somehow. And the foods nowadays are really bad. So I think we need to pray for our food, whatever it is, wherever we're getting it. And ask, because that spirit is in that food. We're eating it and we're taking it into our bodies. So we need to pray for that food, that spirit food, so that it will help us not hurt or harm us in any way. So for the foods, you know, we just have to pray. And the best is what we've always done from the very beginning that we brought with us uh, from our ancient civilization, and that was uh, our prayers to the sun. And like everyone thinks, you know, like I was sitting in my graduate class when they were talking about how the Indians were worshiping the sun. And <laughs> I wanted to say something, but I wanted to pass the class too, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I know that, you know, they think we're pagans and, you know, have all these terms of what they call us and what they think of us. But, you know, it's not that we're worshiping the sun. It's, you know, it's, it's like a science. It's such a high science that Western science hasn't even caught up with it yet. But mm -hmm. it has to do with, uh, okay, sound comes from your heart and your soul, and it comes out mm -hmm. through your mouth. It makes sound. And that sound travels on light. And when you're doing that at sunrise and you're sending those sounds on light, on the light waves to the sun, then it bounces back. And it comes back, it turns things positive. And it comes back. So as the earth turns, then those blessings come back to earth to all the people of the world. And that's why we did it at that time. So it's your sunrise prayers that are really important. And, you know, that can't really be misused because uh, nothing bad can go on those sound waves because the light will burn it. It has to be positive. You got to have that good heart, those positive you know, earnest ways of, you know, getting that, those sound waves onto the sun. So those, yes. you know, go ahead. I was sharing um, earlier, you were talking about the food and I know what people are thinking, you know, why can't they just grow their own food? <laughs> and like, in my tribe, uh, what people don't realize is that, Throughout Indian country, many of the tribes were moved to the worst possible land and where it's almost impossible to grow food and, you know, being forced to be farmers and, um, you know, assimilate, kill the Indian to save the man and become farmers. And where my five acres is on my land, it's rock. It's the, it's the, it's the drain off. You know, we're going to have to figure out how to you know, probably laterally grow, but just your, your thoughts on that, you know, in your own homelands. Are you guys uh, growing out there in Idaho? Well, it takes a while to make a change. And it takes people to make that change. And, yeah, we've, we've had our own farms from time to time throughout different tribal administrations. And, uh, you know, we, we've got really good land that we can grow. Uh, really good crops. We've got water. So we kind of have an ideal situation, and that's something that 
you know, we're, we're looking at as, you know, I'm, I'm not specifically involved in tribal government. Uh, my, actually my son is a chairman of the tribe now, <laughs> but he just got in and he's, you know, that's not enough time to make all the changes that need to be made. And then you're working with a seven headed monster there, you know, try to keep all the mm -hmm. heads together. And it's really, that's, you know, a challenge. And uh, I think that's, that's a good way to go is to grow your own food. And those, you know, along with growing that food, you know, you got to say those prayers to those plants, you know, because that mm -hmm. is in everything. And that plant spirit will catch it and, and, and it'll grow. And that's how we always did it. So there's a lot of things that we can continue to do, you know, with uh, growing our own food and uh, praying for the food that we have so that it doesn't hurt us or give us cancer mm -hmm. and all those ugly things. Uh, I know I'm a sun dancer and that means I fast for four days. And during that time, you know, the, the germs and the bacteria in your body, it has nothing to eat. So it dies within that time. So that's why, you know, I sun dance is to, on the physical level is just to get rid of all of the, the germs and the bacteria that's in your system. And it has to be renewed every year. And, you know, so that you could be clean again. But I think that's what's really kept me alive for, I mean, I'm 75 years old and it's, you know, kept me in a, in a good way of living and so that I don't get sick, so that I don't get cancers or anything like that. But that's, you know, that's your culture, you know, taking part in, in your ceremonies, your the the sweat ceremonies you go in there and you you're praying for your your family your people you're praying say for your mother so that she because she's sick and you know you mm -hmm. come out of that ceremony and then start cussing her out you just got through praying for her you know so there's a lot of things mm -hmm. we can learn and things that we can continue to do and. Uh, Mainly, it's it's through our prayers, and that's mm -hmm. the thing that we have that we can continue to do because your spirit is connected to the entire uh, universal consciousness of ev of all life, and when your spirit is connected, you know you just ask your spirit for that help or what you need. And that, that's connected, and that'll help you. And then you you also pray for that universal life to stay strong and be strong. And uh, in all the, the thank yous, you know, thank you for this. Thank you for, you know, all the help, you know. But we have to learn how to pray as well. You know, we're not praying to Jesus Christ or whatever <laughs> people pray to you know we need to acknowledge our spirit the spirit inside of us that's connected to that universal consciousness so learning how to pray is really important and those are things that we can continue to do and those are things we we did long before christianity was invented in europe so you know i you know, I feel sorry for everyone that, I mean, I'm glad that they're finding ways to have hope, but, you know, you can't. Many people don't know our people were indoctrinated and it was the, the, rigid, the, the religion or the manifest destiny, the doctor discovery was weaponized towards indigenous people. Can you touch a little bit about, a little bit about that? Cause I could see that was on, the next page of your, you know, on page 18, it's right after that a little bit. You go on, you touch a little bit on that. Okay, I'll just uh, 
continue to read a little bit about that. You got the early art of manifest destiny. Is that on page 18? Yeah, that's on page 18. Okay, as the history of Europe and other countries will bear out, entire groups of people were subsequently alienated from their cultural and spiritual base through violent wars upon wars brought by the Christians to kill the non-Christians. Many people were forced to escape the tyranny and oppression of their homelands. Numerous people were estranged, estranged and alienated from their original knowledge, shaken from their foundation by wars and disease. The Americas promised great wealth and glory. Greed for lust of gold soon became the theme for those soon forgot the lessons from the experience they just came through. And a new economy and industry was established for the world base. More than 80% of the food base that now provides the world came from the Americas. It was for all these reasons that many people left their homelands to settle in our country and make their home, but for themselves, both for themselves and their descendants. They justified themselves by calling their greed uh, manifest destiny. Western society is based upon an ideology derived from the ancient Greeks and their governments that have been further developed in time, not only by kings and Christians, but also by scientists and philosophers. Since ancient Greeks, it has all, always been a government of the oppressed and the oppressors or an ideology of control progressing throughout time. This is the patriarchy, a man-made government of laws for male control to oppress the masses and without recognition of women for balance. This system is unnatural and maintains an elite aristocracy in the government to support the very wealthy. We always know that people had to flee Europe because of this oppressive society that denied basic freedoms of religion and justice. In America, the land was so plentiful that greed became pivotal, pivotal in the plunder and genocidal methodology used to dispossess the indigenous populations of their lands and resources. And I guess the, the manifest destiny part was, you know, it was just something that they believed was their fate, you know, that they had the right to kill Indians and take the land. And uh, in the name of God. In the name of God, yes. <laughs> so yeah, I I mean, you know, like I, I say, wow, what a trip that must have been, you know, but they unfortunately it was their way of thinking. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, it's uh, this comes from an indigenous perspective, looking, looking out at what was coming on. You know, so don't don't take anything personal because I know people get, you know, think that I'm taking. Well, you know, it's a little hard truth, you know, because this is this is not what they learn in in grade school, high school. And colleges are just starting to, you know, incorporate Native American studies. And that's why I say so it's content. if they could just tell the truth, you know, because like it, I think they're winging it. Well, unfortunately, but you know, as many people as as can be uh, educated. <laughs> taught the truth, you know, it's just, just like, you know, the say the way that we all know how Trump was, right? We know that he, you know, was pretty racist and discriminatory, et cetera, et cetera. Well, all of the people used to be like that, you know, we're coming from that, that mentality. American people are coming from that mentality, 
Mm -hmm. but they become more enlightened, more educated, more, uh, more human where they acknowledge that they, they can't have these, you know, discriminatory racist, uh, actions that they've had you know people that uh, are not very enlightened I guess they uh, what they ignore the truth to ignore you know even when the truth is presented they'll ignore it and that's what you call ignorance so it's coming from a very ignorant, kind of mentality but people are getting better they're becoming more educated and and you know we're watching this because you know we're the we're the one we're the kind we're the ones that are receiving their the the end of it of how they are towards us you know we're kind of like mm -hmm. the, the canary in the bird cage so to speak you know the connection mm -hmm. in the mind as the oxygen leaves and the air becomes more toxic and and the bird finally dies. That's us. <laughs> and it's always been us. And and that mind is is America, you know. Mm -hmm. Better that people are, then you know, they treat us better. Our land is treated better. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind. We're kind of like that. Uh, we're the, we're the canary, so to speak. And you feel that because we are connected to the land. That's why we love the land. They're they're not connected to the land, and so well, they don't have that same feeling. Well, indigenous people are worldwide, and they're all connected to the land. Now, throughout time, things change. And people change things, you know, leaders, religious leaders or whatever. And it doesn't look much like it was originally, but originally we've we've kept pretty close because we were the last continents left maintaining that spirituality and those natural laws. So um, what was that? question you said well we're connected to the land oh. so you know we we harvest our traditional foods and medicines we're connected when the land changes we know because we change right so indigenous people are connected to the land through their prayers and the natural laws but american society is not connected to the land america you know american so-called american culture is more of a corporate culture than it is. It's not an indigenous culture. So they're disconnected and they don't know that they're supposed to protect the earth, not mm -hmm. and mine it. But, you know, this all happened in Europe so long ago. They did that to Europe and... And then they came over and started doing the same thing here. And it's just a matter of time that people have to learn. And the more people that learn, the better. And hopefully yeah. they will be the dominant group at some point. But it's it's going to have to have to start somewhere. And it has started. I know a lot of our older people traveled and uh you know, Thomas Banyaka, he was an international world traveler. He, you know, told about the prophecies. And we used to have uh, people like that, Corbin Harney. And mm -hmm. uh, we had our own spiritual people that are all gone now. And who's left? We're the only ones left. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's getting scary. Um, so we've reached we've reached our hour here and you know we've had some technical difficulties in the morning in the in the early uh first live stream but i'm really glad that we were able to go through here and uh thank you for 
you know, having patience and, and Haps jumping on and helping us in the tech team and, and uh, we're able to get this going. I'd like to see this all throughout Indian country where community journalists can come forward and share in the community what's going on and their voices can be more amplified and then visibility become more visible. Is there any final thoughts you'd like to share before we close out about your book? And how do we get your book? I looked up the, well, I looked up on the line, Dr. Uh, Dr. Warjack. You can go to um, Dr. Warjack. Let's see. Where's the at here? Dr. Warjack is Nate. Yes. drwarjack.com. And I put it also in the in the chat where you can buy the book. The book is 25% off, twenty nine ninety five. And any final thoughts, Lenita? Well, I just uh, hope that it strikes your curiosity so that you want to read and get some new ideas and start learning because our earth isn't going to last too much longer the way that we're going now. And um, we need to stay strong. And what a, the elders used to tell us before they left is that we have to maintain that spiritual ear so that we can hear and it's not really through our ear, but I mean, the ear is just, uh, I guess, the word that they use. But we have to stay in touch with our, our spirit because it'll guide us, you know, if uh, it comes to an end. Uh, if the world is so imbalanced and it, it topples, what do you call it? The topples the axis. Because uh, it's got to stay in balance, and it will stay in balance, but, you know, <laughs> the world will live, but we're, we're not going to be able to make it unless we stay with our spirituality and keep our prayers and be guided. Mm -hmm. Lead your spirit along the way. What you, would you say when I says you're going to live up to see 120? And you said yeah. it's not quantity, it's quality. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, I like at my age, I, I'm, when you're young, you know, it's not really bad like that. Or at least not, not for me, it wasn't. But yeah, quality. Quality. Quality of life. And um, to allies out there, what would you like to share with allies that are watching? What does it mean to be a good ally? Well, you must learn as much as you can and uh, and say your prayers. You know, prayers are really important because, like I said, it travels through light to the plants, the animals, the people. It's real. And it's something that uh, we need to maintain is our prayers. Pray for everybody and thank Give your thanks and pray for all life, plants and animals, everything, water. But we got to keep this up. And it's not just our problem. As Native people, we can see it. And we'll be the first out there to fight for it. But mm -hmm. we need your help. And, and it's your fight, too. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you need to join us. You need to be supportive. And, and I hope that my book can help you get started on your journey. Dr. So. Warjack.com. Dr. Warjack.com. You can buy the book, $29.95. Native Resistance. This will actually, you know, help you in articulating some of the issues that indigenous people are going through. And what, what grade level would this be? High school and college? Well, it's it's pretty... Uh, it's for different age groups. So it goes college, high school, uh, regular, normal uh, conversations, regular... What do you call that? Uh, 
I don't think Manifest Destiny is a uh, American conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them don't even know what it is. Well, it's kind of a collection of, you know, so that people can tune in to where they can tune in. I know Damon said he read that first chapter and he wasn't even going to read my book because he said, you're preaching to the choir here. And he read that first chapter and he said it just blew his mind completely. And now he's mm -hmm. going to do his interviews and, and talk more about the book. So I know that it'll... You know, I've been Go ahead. Yeah, so he maybe we'll maybe we'll get him on next time to explain his thoughts on the book as well. That'd be good. The Alcatraz kid, he was on Alcatraz with us. He was the kid I was yeah. having to take over the uh, to the mainland to get him clean. Oh, <laughs> poor guy. <laughs> Well, we'll have we'll have a more we'll have another in depth discussion again. I think it would be really good to do this every week as we go through the chapters awesome. to be able to give an overview and and uh, probably some aha moments as you're also reading your own book in audio. And uh, how long did it take you to write this book? Well, I started I think uh, after I finished my dissertation in. 99 and i thought i was going to use a large part of that and and i didn't it was too different i know i have like seven versions of this book over the last years <laughs> let's see that was in 99 when i uh finished my dissertation so you sent me another copy and said throw the other one away <laughs> Don't the other one away. Forget it. <laughs> yeah, and and it's you know it's it's been a blessing along the way. So I want to say thank you again for your time and coming on. And um, we'll have to have this more just conversation again down the road. And uh, next week we'll we'll start with chapter two. How's that sound? Sounds good. All right. Um, and now we got all the technical difficulties out of the way. We're good to go. Well, I had to use my new Mac, so there's it's all updated. I don't know why I didn't do that. Oh, you're ahead of, you're ahead of everyone now. You got the brand new Mac and you're ready to go. I know. I am. <laughs> okay, thanks and thank you everybody. All righty. Thank you. Dr. Lanita Warjack. Get a hold of her on drwarjack.com. By the book, Native Resistance, brought to you, and uh, she'll get it out to you right away. You got the source right here. You can get the book right away. It's not on Amazon. Straight up from the author. All righty, Lenada. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Punita, right. good chatting with you. Thank you. Good night. He shot you. Good night.